before you start lesson two, make sure you do test A. Just keep doing this test every time they ask you to do it until you can get a perfect hundred on it. Once you can do that, then you don't really need to do it anymore. Lesson two has two parts. The first part is on properties of operations, and the second part is on sequences. The two most important properties to remember are the commutative property and the associative property. Both of these properties relate to addition and multiplication. There is no commutative property of addition, I'm sorry, division, or a commutative property for subtraction. Same with associative property. Both of those properties relate to addition and multiplication. Something to keep in mind when you're thinking of the commutative property is this phrase, order does not matter. And for the associative property, remember, grouping does not matter. Let's look at a couple of examples. For commutative property, 2 plus 3 is the same thing as saying 3 plus 2 doesn't matter what order you put down the add-ins. You can have the 2 first or the 3 first. 2 plus 3 is the same thing as 3 plus 2. Same with multiplication. 2 times 3 is the same thing as 3 times 2. The order that you do that, put those numbers in, those factors in multiplication does not matter. Remember these only work for addition and multiplication. Think about subtraction. That wouldn't work. 2 minus 3 equals 3 minus 2. The order does matter there. You can't say 2 minus 3. You get a negative number, which you'll learn about later on in the year. So that doesn't work. It doesn't work for subtraction or division. We can talk about these relationships in terms of variables as well. So for any number, A and B, where A could be a 1, a 2, a 3, it could be any number. B could be any number. We could say A plus B is the same thing as B plus A, where A and B can be any numbers. And then for that would be like the commutative property for addition. For multiplication, we could say A times B is equal to B times A. Now let's talk about the associative property where grouping does not matter. And what we mean there is grouping some numbers in parentheses. And we use parentheses like to separate a group of numbers. And we could have maybe 1 plus 2 plus 3. We could say that is the same thing as 1 plus parentheses 2 plus 3. Those two things are the same. For example, if we simplified those two problems, we could put the 1 plus 2, we could do that first. That's usually what you do when you have parentheses, is you work the part inside the parentheses first. So on the left side, we could say 1 plus 2 is 3 plus 3. That's the same thing as 1 plus 5. And that makes sense. 6 equals 6. So that would be considered the associative property of addition. Another way we could talk about this, just a more general way, is using our variables or letters again. We could say parentheses A plus B plus C is equal to A plus parentheses B plus C. Think of multiplication. Same idea here. We could do 3 times 4 parentheses times 5 is equal to 3 times parentheses 4 times 5. On the left, if we worked inside the parentheses first, we'd have 12 times 5, that's 60. And on the right, we'd say 3 times 20, which is 60. The parentheses, or what we, how we group those factors, does not matter. And so again, a more general way of writing that would be a times B inside parentheses times C is equal to A times parentheses B times C. We call that the commute or the associative property of multiplication. So 
just keep in mind when we talk about those letters instead of numbers like the A, the B, and the C that we've been considering, that means any number could be substituted in for A and for B and for C. It doesn't matter what numbers we put in there, the properties still hold true. So the commutative and associative properties hold true for addition and multiplication of any numbers. Not just 1, 2, and 3, or 3, 4, and 5. Now let's talk about some less important properties. Before we do that though, keep in mind that you're supposed to take notes on everything I write on the board. So you should have everything that I have written down on the screen right now, you should have that on your paper. You should work every practice problem that I work. Pause the CD and rewind if you don't understand something. That's how you get the best use out of the dive CDs. Let's talk about the identity property briefly. What that means is, like for addition, you can't change the identity of a value, let's call it A, if you add zero to it. It's still equal to whatever number that happens to be that you use for A. For example, let's say A was 2. 2 plus 0 equals 2. You don't change the identity of that number. For multiplication, it would be times 1. You can multiply any number times 1 and it still remains that number. You don't change its identity. So the identity property for multiplication is any number times 1. For addition, it's any number plus 0 will not change its identity. And then lastly, let's talk about the 0 property. This is probably something you already know, just like you already kind of know the identity property. Any number, we'll call that a for representing any number times 0 equals 0. That just works for multiplication. So that's the 0 property for multiplication. Any number times 0 equals 0. Look at practice problem A. It says to write two addition facts and two subtraction facts with these numbers 5, 2, and 7. Well, when you see a problem like that where they ask you about addition and subtraction facts, basically what they want you to do is write an equation that is true. And so let's think of two addition facts. For example, we could say that 5 plus 2 is equal to 7. And then we could use our commutative property for addition to remember that 2 plus 5 equals 7 as well. The order that we put those numbers in does not matter. So those are two addition facts. Now two subtraction facts, by the way, addition and subtraction, we consider those inverse operations. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But let's just think of a subtraction fact with those three numbers. We could do 7 minus 2 is equal to 5. And we could also do 7 minus 5 equals 2. Something to notice here, the sum of those addition problems was 7. We could undo that addition by subtracting one of the add-ends, like we took the sum 7, subtracted an add-end of 2 in that first subtraction problem, and we got 5 for an answer. Subtraction undoes addition. That's what inverse operations do. Now just like addition and subtraction are inverse operations, multiplication and division are also inverse operations. So let's do this problem B. Write two multiplication and two division facts using 3, 15, and 5. Well, we'll use our commutative property of multiplication to help us think of two multiplication facts. Order doesn't matter, so we could write 3 times 5 equals 15, and we could also write 5 times 3 is equal to 15. Now there's no such thing as a commutative property for division. Order does matter in division. Why don't you pause the CD and see if you can write two division facts. Well you could have 15 divided by 3 I'll just use a fraction bar, or division bar, to separate the dividend from the divisor. 15 divided by 3 is 5, and then we could also have 15 
divided by 5 equals 3. Just like subtraction undoes the results of an addition problem, division undoes the results of a multiplication problem. And they are inverse operations. Multiplication and division are inverse operations. So there's our two multiplication and two division facts using those three numbers, 3, 15, and 5. Let's do a few more problems here. Let's work these problems by solving what's inside the parentheses first. Now we were discussing the associative property. That's where grouping doesn't matter when you're talking about an addition or a multiplication problem. We talked about our groups or the things inside parentheses. We usually work those first. So on practice problem C, let's go ahead and do that. And we'll work inside the parentheses first. 6 plus 8 is 14 plus 9. That's equal to 23. And so there's our answer. Now that was an addition problem. So the parentheses really didn't matter. We could have had 6 plus parentheses 8 plus 9. Our answer still would have equaled 23. That's not the same for that practice problem D, though. Let's work that one due inside the parentheses first. And we'll have 12 minus 5 minus 1. That would equal a 4. 12 minus 4 is equal to 8. So just think about this. Order or grouping does matter in a subtraction problem, not in an addition problem, though. For example, if we would have had 12 minus 5 in parentheses and then minus 1, Think about that. Do the parentheses first. 12 minus 5 is 7 minus 1. That equals 6. A different answer. Grouping does matter in a subtraction problem and division. It doesn't matter in multiplication or in addition. So in practice problem E, the parentheses really don't matter in that multiplication problem. But we'll go ahead and just for practice, it's a good idea to get used to that, anytime you have a problem that has parentheses in it, you work what's inside the parentheses first. So we have 6 times 2 times 3, that's just equal to 6, equals 36. Multiplication, grouping does not matter. It does matter in division, though, in practice problem F. And so here we need to definitely work the problem work inside the parentheses first, so we'll end up with 18 divided by 6 divided by 3, which would just be 2. 18 divided by 2 equals 9. Think about it. If we had a different grouping here, like 18 divided by 6 divided by 3. 18 divided by 6 is 3 divided by 3 equals 1. Again, a different answer there because of the way the parentheses were. Grouping does matter in division and subtraction. It does not matter in multiplication and addition. Before we go on to the next part on sequences, I want you to just notice something. Notice how I'm working these problems. And remember, you should be writing the problems down just like I do. Now, of course, you can always pause the CD and try to figure out the problem yourself and then turn it back on to check and see if you got the answer right. Definitely you can do that. But the amount of work that's written on the board, that's the very minimum that you should have on your paper. And just notice how I'm solving these problems. I'm working them out vertically and that helps me keep things organized. For example, look at practice problem C. The 6 and the 8 added together to get that 14 there. And then we have the plus sign pretty much underneath the other one and the 9 underneath. And so we kind of try to keep things in order. Look at practice problem D. I have the 12 right underneath the 12. And then the 5 minus 1 turned into that 4 right there. We have the minus sign in the same spot. So if you work the problems vertically like that, rather than writing the answer out to the right side here like that, I think it just helps you keep things organized and kind of keep a list it helps you remember what you've changed and what you're keeping the same for the next part of the problem. 
one of the biggest reasons for a mistake in math is not because you don't understand how to do the problem, it's because you make a careless mistake. And so you want to try to eliminate as many careless mistakes as possible. Being neat and organized is one way to prevent that. Now let's talk about sequences. And a thing to remember about sequences is what I have written there on the board. Find the pattern. You're looking for a pattern in a set of numbers or a sequence of numbers. That's what a sequence of numbers is, is a set of numbers that have a pattern to them. Look at practice problem G. Try to find the three missing numbers that I have there in that sequence. Well, you have 3, 7, 11, 15, 19. What's the pattern there? Find the pattern. Well, aren't you adding 4 each time? 3 plus 4 is 7, plus 4 is 11, plus 4 is 15, plus 4 is 19, plus another 4 would be 23. And then another 4 would be 27, and another 4 would be 31. So 23, 27, 31. Those would be the next three numbers in that sequence. Look at problem H. Why don't you pause the CD and figure out what the next three numbers in that sequence are. Well, you should notice that each subsequent number is multiplied by 2. You multiply the previous number by 2 to get the next number. So you'd have 16 times 2 is 32. 32 times 2 is 64. 64 times 2 is 128. So those would be the next three numbers in that sequence. And look at practice problem I. Find the next three numbers in that sequence. So in other words, find the pattern. What is the pattern? Well, if you notice, each one of those is a squared term, like 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 5 squared is 25, 6 squared is 36. So 7 squared, that's 49. 8 squared is 64. 9 squared is 81. So those are the next three numbers in that sequence there. So when you're trying to figure out the next few terms in a sequence, when you see a problem like that, the whole key is to find the pattern. What is the pattern that will solve that? Most math problems that you're solving, you're trying to find or you're using some kind of pattern to solve that problem. There's some pattern that you're searching for, whether it's some kind of formula that you need to use, or if you just need to figure out what operation is being used in a particular sequence like these that we're doing here. The different formulas that you use and that you'll be learning as well as the basic operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, those are your tools that you use to help you solve the different problems that you'll be facing. Just like in real life, anytime you have a certain problem that you're trying to figure out, whether it's trying to change the oil in your car, or figuring out why your child is sick. There are different tools that you use, different things that you need to help you solve those problems. It's the same in math. Okay, well that's all for lesson two.